Oh, there's Anka. Hi. Hello from Germany. Oh. We just <laughs> had a conversation yesterday. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Great to see you. And here's Michael. Yay, Michael. And Lily. Welcome, Lily. Hello. We really like it when people put their cameras on so we can socially engage. There's Michael. Hello, how are you? You're muted. There I'm you good. go. Good to see you again. Yeah. Michael and I are <laughs> just have a nice connection Hi, yesterday. Hi, Rashawn. Hi, Michael. Again, too. Oh, Sandra Bore is joining us. Sandra and I are doing something tomorrow. Do you know Sandra? Uh, Heather. No, I don't. Sandra does these amazing, um, Sandra, what do you call them? Story, they're like storyboards. They're Val sketch nuts. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> they're amazing. She did one. You did one uh, at a something that I was doing, I think. Um, with with, with uh, Florence Bernard. It was amazing. Yeah. So it's great to see you. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing a podcast. It's great. And Michelle is here. Oh, and John. Hello, John. There we go. This is the fun part. This is my favorite part. Hello, John. How are you? Hi, Jen. Hello, everyone. Hi, Heather. Very well. Hi. Thank you. Where is everybody? Maybe you can put in uh, beside your name. So John's in UK and Anka is in Germany. Mary Kenton, where are you? Uh, I'm in Oregon. In Oregon? Okay. And Sandra's in, in France, right? Yeah, in France, near Versailles. Ah, beautiful. And Lily's in Wisconsin. Michael's in Santa Barbara. Michelle, where are you? I'm calling in from Dallas, Texas. Okay. Nice. And Annette? And that's connecting with us. We'll just wait a couple of more minutes and then we're gonna do a nice grounding practice to bring ourselves into the space like we do. And then we've got Heather Abernethy as our guest, which is gonna be great. Okay, let's start. And Rashan, you'll keep inviting people in? Yep. Okay. Nice to stay to the schedule. Staying to the schedule helps bodies to feel safe. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this is what we're doing. We said we were doing this and this is what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. So settling yourself in your chair. And you might want to stand up. Some people really enjoy standing up when they focus. So just letting your body decide. Relaxing your arms and legs. And then if it feels okay, you can drop your attention somewhere down into the center of your body. Always remembering that if that doesn't feel comfortable today, you can just focus on something in the room. We're just checking to see how close it's comfortable to be inside yourself.
bringing your attention into this space. Maybe saying hello to your nervous system. Checking in with neuroception. And then maybe checking in with your felt sense, this kind of introceptive process. How am I in here today? And you might want to put a hand where you feel something there in your body that is talking to you. Or sensing into where you are in your life. And just being with that for a moment. And then when you're ready, you can slowly round it off inside, knowing that whatever that is in there, if it might want some more attention later on today. And just thanking your body for letting it go. And slowly coming back to our group. Hmm. Our wonderful polyvagal group. Okay. So today we have with us uh, Dr. Heather Abernethy, and I'm going to actually read Heather's introduction, because I think it's a really good way of describing what we're going to do today. So Dr. Heather Abernethy is an anesthetologist who feels at home in the operating room, but finds the greatest satisfaction in listening to her patients before and after surgery. Dr. Abernethy spent years supporting patients in the operating room and the OB suites. After a series of traumatic events, she sought treatment for PTSD and discovered the wonders of the polyvagal theory for healing and growth. She teaches healthcare providers about using the PBT and autonomic nervous system regulation in busy medical settings. She's presented the importance of healthcare autonomic state awareness and regulation at the 2022 PBT Summit and to numerous academic institutions. She envisions a future in which physicians have training and skills to receive the information their bodies are giving them, allowing them to find a state of compassion and curiosity for both their patients and themselves. So I'm gonna spotlight Heather and me so you can see us better. And just for the beginning part, and then we'll come back to you uh, later on so we can do some good Q&A. So hello. Hi, thank you, Jan. You're welcome. Heather and I know each other physically, which is rare these days. Right. <laughs> but we, we actually, person. yeah, we met in person at the October PBI Summit. And you actually kicked it off with really honestly an amazing presentation it was like a ted talk we all said thank you yeah it was just fantastic thank you and really exciting you know in terms of how you're you're bringing uh polyvagal theory into medicine which is so desperately needed yes it is it is a very disembodied space and what i have been thrilled to experience is that people are incredibly receptive to it 
mm -hmm. that I have approached it with a little hesitation, not sure how it would be received as new things are not always well received in the medical world. But yeah. I think with COVID, people are desperate to feel better and they are looking and they're open and curious and this just lands. They, they feel it. They know that it's true. And what I've experienced and what someone stood up and said after one of my talks is they said, thank you for presenting this because it gives us a reason to be human. It gives us permission to be human. It takes the shame out of having needs. Yeah. Out of, exactly. yeah. yeah. Out of being able to meet our needs and to name yeah. them. Yeah. That is so true. Isn't it? I think it's, it's a fundamental, um, piece of polyvagal theory right right that that it just really in a in a way that i've never seen before right um, helps people with shame yes yeah because it normalizes equalizer. how bodies work right, right. yeah right. yes and i find that with my patients that that's exactly it that if i can if they are experiencing something, anxiety, worry, fear, which is so common right before you go into surgery, when you lose all control. Yeah. And if I can say, oh, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. And mm -hmm. then you feel this relief, like, oh, I don't have to explain myself or I don't have to feel shame. This person just accepts that it makes sense. And my body makes sense. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like something really fundamental happens in medical training that really um, seems to, if people begin to believe that they have to separate themselves from their feelings in order to be of help. <laughs> yes, I think that is one facet of it, that there is that old thinking that you can't get too close. You need to distance yourself. You're not going to be able to take care of your patients if you connect with them on a, you know, an emotionally deep level. But beyond that, there's also the training, the medical training, mm -hmm. which disembodies you. Yeah. So you are rewarded. You're trained. You survive from no longer noticing. Mm -hmm. So you stop noticing what your body is telling you and what you need. And some of that's things like, well, yes, I need to be in surgery for eight hours straight. So I'm hungry. I need to use the restroom. I'm tired. It, you need to not notice in order to make it through. Mm -hmm. And that's the physical part of it. So you start to lose that interceptive awareness. But then there's also the part of, well, just to survive, you, there's so much shame involved that you need to not notice also. You need to dissociate, disembody, and that's how you make it through. And at the end, it doesn't stop and no one brings you back. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, uh, a kind of little microcosm of hypermasculinity. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah, there's also all of the thing around the sleep deprivation and, you know, go for, going for three or four days on call. And um, yeah, it's correct. It's, it's and things have changed hard. from, you know, I did my training 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. And at that time, there weren't rules around how much a resident could work. So yeah. now there are rules. Mm -hmm. And the rules are a resident cannot work more than 80 hours a week. <laughs> so that, oh, is, good. <laughs> right. So before that, I, I easily worked over 80 hours a week. And yet we're expected to make our best choices, to be our best self while we're incredibly sleep deprived. Yeah, which scary. is not possible. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how, how you kind of found this journey through the trauma lens. Mm. Yeah, well, as most journeys um, happen, it was very personal. So one thing I experienced is I had PTSD, pretty debilitating for a few years. And it really hit home when, you know, I've spent 30 years in a hospital. I love hospitals. I love operating rooms. This is where I feel most at home. And I needed to go to the doctor for a routine medical procedure, very minimal, not painful. 
And during this time, when I had PTSD, I found myself in the waiting room, in the fetal position, like in a chair, but rocking back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what is wrong with me? Clearly there's something wrong with me. This is nothing. This is my home away from home. This is where I feel safe. Mm -hmm. And so it started this journey of, wait, I'm, I don't want to do this. My body is doing this. Why is it doing this? Yeah. I'm embarrassed that I'm, there's a technician standing next to me and I can't sit up straight. Oh, boy. And this idea then of looking into that and realizing, oh no, my body's trying to protect me. Yeah. Yeah. It's doing what it needs to do to keep me safe. Right into dorsal. Right there. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so when I could flip it and start to look at that through the lens of curiosity and learning, I had an amazing therapist who taught me embodiment, who mm. taught me about the polyvagal theory. And, and I like to say there's the knowledge of the polyvagal theory and there's the practice of the there's polyvagal the, theory. The real embodiment, that's what we, Correct. we do in my work, yes, is going right into the felt sense and the embodiment of polyvagal theory of the autonomic nervous system. Right, right. And it's so perfect because anesthesiology is a study of the autonomic nervous system. So it, you know, I am constantly watching other people's heart rates, blood pressure, right? Yeah. How they're reacting and responding yes. so to bring that to myself was really fascinating and yeah. to share it with my colleagues yeah. and, you know, what we can offer our patients. I mean, I experienced this as I couldn't just go right into it. It was too much. Yeah. So I had to look at it one molecule at a time, one tiny bit at a time while someone sat with me. Yeah. So I could tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we can bring to our patients. Mm -hmm. We can sit with them with their discomfort, the tiny bit at a time. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of what we're describing in terms of medical training, I mean, a lot of it happens uh, for therapists too. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, it's changing somewhat now. Um, but there's been a lot of, of real um, indoctrination around separating, you know, sitting behind a desk, not becoming too, too close to your clients, and keeping this kind of um, um, false, really false sense of uh, professionalism and boundaries that become very rigid. Did Heather just freeze? Sean, did Heather freeze? Can you see? Yeah, it looks it looks like that to me as well. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I wonder. Can we connect with her in the chat? Uh, oh. Oh. She's gone. No. Okay, okay, maybe well, maybe she's trying to come back in again. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's never happened before. <laughs> Quite like <laughs> that. This is such an interesting experience from a polyvagal lens too, right? It's like I'm talking to somebody and then all of a sudden there's no life. There's no movement. And I'm like, is this person really here? Is this, what is this? You know, it's like a real practice in neuroception. What's going on? And how is my body responding? Did people notice that? It's like, what's going on there? A real moment in neuroception. Am I, I've lost connection. I'm not safe anymore in this connection with this person. Very interesting, wow. Well, let's see, um, what should we do? We can go back to the gallery view for a moment. Um, yeah. Just come back to the group and see Hopefully, she joins us again. See if anyone has any questions already. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. Well, wasn't that weird? So, any thoughts? How are you finding all of this in your body? That feeling, that place that came so quickly, right? Of how we can feel shame about our, how our bodies respond and how Heather's describing that it was that moment where she went into dorsal and then recognizing as a patient how shaming that can be in that system, right? 
I find when I go back into that system, I really talk to myself about how this is a screwed up system. <laughs> I'm not screwed up. This system is screwed up. And if, if my body feels unsafe or intruded upon, that's okay, right? It is being intruded upon. Yeah. But it's, it's a journey. Michael, does everybody know Michael? Michael is, um, is a course um, educator, just like I am in the play zone on the uh, PVI. Hi. I just, I find it fascinating when she talks about how the training itself, yeah, in a way, forcing the body, forcing the disconnection, yeah. right? As she framed it, the not noticing, yeah. just find that fascinating. And that in the world of athletics, it's the same thing. It's that you there, it's this under, it's this message that's not even talked about, but it's separate from the feelings. She's back. Here we go. Here she is. <laughs> Okay, Heather. I mean, that made my nervous system. Activated. I know. I know. <laughs> come on, come back to me. Here we yeah. go. We're all good. Yeah. We just we we're talking about how um, that that point of shame, you know, how that is so powerful in terms of uh, needing to really hold on to ourselves. And I imagine that you're working at that point a lot, right? To validate how bodies work. This is just yeah. how bodies work. So I keep saying to people about addiction too. It's like, this is just what bodies do <laughs> to survive. Yes. And, and then we pathologize it. It's like crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I think to not pathologize it, you have to look at yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's a yeah. different paradigm. Yeah. Very different, very different paradigm. But I, I love the way, I mean, this is, this happens for therapists too, right? We have all these rules around one of them that I think is, is kind of hilarious is that you can't accept any gift from a client. So mm -hmm. if a client brings you a Christmas box of chocolates, you can't accept it. <laughs> no, it's, so so yeah, you can't form that relationship, that trust, that bond. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us some more. How did you get from the dorsal state into where you are now with your journey? Mm, slowly. Yeah. Okay. At that point, um, that was really frustrating for me. I really was used to putting my mind to something yeah. and doing the steps. And yeah. if I do the steps and I put my mind to it and I commit hundred percent, it's going to happen. And it's going well, to happen quickly. That's medical training too. Right. right. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, that was the number one thing to really accept is that this is going to take time and it doesn't mean I'm doing years. anything wrong. Yeah. Years, right? Years. Yeah. Yes. And every day is meaningful yeah. and it's a step and it's a journey about learning about myself and the people around me who I care about yeah and showing up for yourself every day in whatever way that you can mm -hmm. and so I learned about our autonomic states mm -hmm. I learned about what they look like physically what they look like I learned about what how they feel mm -hmm. and then I just continue to be curious and I would look at my patients differently. And I can get a sense when I walk into a room, when I open the door, I can feel what state is this person in? Yeah. And then how can I provide a sense of state of safety so they can show up mm -hmm. so they can feel held and heard and safe because that's optimal for healing and vitality, especially right before you go into surgery. Yeah, because surgery is such a violation. Yes. Yeah. And so there's a lot of, you know, top down and bottom up that we need to do to let the body know that it really is safe to be cut here. Right. We're making this decision top down to do this, right? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. And so many people are nervous, they're terrified, and they're embarrassed that they feel that way. Yeah. How ridiculous is that? Right. It makes so much sense. Yeah. 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 So sharing that with them and for me to find my way here, like you asked, 
just daily practices throughout the day of mm -hmm. breathing, of checking in, of recognizing my state mm -hmm. of compassion, mm -hmm. and then asking, what does that need? Mm -hmm. Before I go into a patient's room, what do I need? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not in a good state, they're not going to feel safe enough. Mm -hmm. So when you said at the beginning that you found that people are really receptive, were you also talking about colleagues, other physicians? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So tell us a bit about that. What, what uh, in the operating room now, um, do you have colleagues, the surgeons or whatever, the nurses, or whatever, that are engaging with you in this dialogue around polyvagal theory? Yeah, the nurses are very receptive. Yeah, yeah I'm so, sure. Yeah. yeah, they're they're wonderful. Yeah, I they love probably love you for this, right? <laughs> Because this I love is, them. I mean, nursing is about making the relationship too, right? Correct. Big part of it. Correct. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, the, the surgeons are receptive. There's probably not as much of a dialogue yet as yeah. I would like, but they come up to me individually. Yes. So outside <laughs> of the group. That's so interesting too, right? Yes. Like they feel safer to talk to you individually than to put it out there in the group. Right. Right. Yeah. But that's how you start. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I even had when there was a gentleman who was helping me set up and doing the AV stuff for me and going through some of my slides. And then he came up to me and he said, you know, my therapist was just talking to me about this mm -hmm. the other day. And he said, do you mind if I stay and listen to your talk? Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So it's not right. It applies to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone. Yeah. So what's your kind of edge right now do you have a particular interest or yes so I love talking about attunement I love training healthcare providers about attunement and nervous system regulation yeah yeah and attunement to ourselves and attunement to our patients mm -hmm. right that's and, what and I love to talk what about what kind of processes do you use with attunement yeah well I talk to them about the four a's because you can't just talk to them about a felt sense, right? They don't understand that. Yeah. And so the four A's gives me a path in and I talk about awareness. That's the first one. Again, awareness of our nervous system. Yeah. So having the education about that and what yeah. does it look like? And then start to introduce, well, how does that feel? So awareness of your nervous system and awareness of your patient's nervous system. Yeah, that's huge. It's huge. And then accessibility, oh, nice. right? Can you make yourself accessible? And what does that look like? Oh. And what it means is you have to check your ego at the door. Oh, beautiful. You, know, you can't walk in with an agenda or an idea of it has to go this way. Mm -hmm. And so you need to stay accessible and open and curious yeah. about what's going on inside yourself as you interact with this person and what's going on inside the other person as they're interacting with you. So again, co-regulation, neuroception, talking oh. about that. And then we're accountable. So accountability, mm -hmm. we're accountable to manage our state so that we respond instead of react. Beautiful. And then the last one is authenticity. We have to be who we are mm -hmm. or people see right through us, especially people who've experienced trauma and they're not going to trust us. Yeah. I think those, those, those of us who have experienced a lot of trauma have really good radar for authenticity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we may not always follow it if we don't feel grounded enough to back ourselves up yet. Right. I think it's there, you know, it's really there in terms of whether we can feel safe with this other person. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And the other thing in in the healthcare field right now, which is very um, popular and discussed as trauma-informed care, yes. which is great. It's important. It needs to be talked about and brought to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And this ties in so well with it, right? Oh, because yeah. the, the tenants of trauma-informed care are safety, yeah. right? That's the number one, right? Choice. Can mm -hmm. you give your patient a choice? Collaboration. So you're working together to collaborate with that person, trustworthiness, which again, isn't just what you say, but how do you feel? 
yeah. and empowerment, recognizing your patient is the expert in themselves. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Boy, that's a big leap for a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I have faith in them. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's yeah. good. So I'm curious, when you learned about the nervous system, did you learn anything about uh, the dorsal vagus? No. This was, this was a long time ago, right? This was a long time ago. Yeah. And now when you see uh, young interns and residents coming forward, are any of them learning about gorgeous polyvagal? No, still no. not. Yeah. Still not. Yeah. No. Yeah. So yes, when I talk about it, it is a new concept. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got work to do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, what else is important for you to share right now in terms of Mm. where you're at and what's going on? Are you writing? I do write. Some, mm-hmm. I have an Instagram account where I write on there at Dr. Heather Abernathy. Okay. I have a course on the Polyvagal Institute, right, specifically right. for the polyvagal theory for healthcare providers. And it's not just for physicians, it's for anyone who interacts with patients. Yeah, beautiful. And I'd even say it's for anyone who is a patient. Yes, yeah. Because, well, yeah, because that's, that's a way of really educating ourselves, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, to be advocates for ourselves, mm-hmm. to know what we deserve mm-hmm. yeah. and the science behind it. Yeah. Well, I think it's amazing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Hard work. And how do you, do you get caught up sometimes in feelings of being insecure around giving these kinds of messages? And Absolutely. How do you take care of yourself with that? You know, I do get caught up in that. I think if I didn't, you know, I'm not sure I'd be human. Exactly. Um, Yeah. Yes, I do. And then I come back, I do a technique kind of like what you did at the beginning. I get really still and I come back Mm -hmm. to what is my intention? What is my purpose? Mm -hmm. What is my message? And sometimes I even have to get as basic as, well, is this message harming anyone? Well, of course not. Is it helping? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, what else I find is really helpful is our community, right? Mm -hmm. When we can all be together and feel, um, I feel a lot of uh, Steve at my back Mm -hmm. (laughs) and all of us, all of you and and Michael and all of us that, that we're really supporting each other to do the work because um, it is hard work and um and it isn't, it isn't always understood the way that we intend it to be understood either. No. Um, and even in the, you know, the trauma field and particularly in addiction, um, it's, it's still a, 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 sl- a slog, you know, to really get the message across that we can shift from these medicalized models of pathologizing basic structures that happen in the body. Right. Uh, into into really um, being able to hold our own with it all. So it's important that we have this community to be able to do that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how about we come back and see what people are? Does that sound good? Yeah, that'd be great. All right, let's do it. So I'm going to remove the spotlight and come back to gallery view. So, questions? Hi, Robert. I didn't see you. I saw you come in a bit laughter. Yeah. So, what's happening in your body? Oh, Michael, got a question or something happening? I, I do. I do have a question for Heather. Um, hi, Michael. Hi, Heather. Uh, as I, I don't know the answer to this, and we've talked so many times, but was there any in in your beginning of your healing? Was there any particular moment or relationship for you that that was really the hand on your back? Mm-hmm. Yes, that was definitely my therapist who was there. Mm-hmm. Really the most, you know, I think it was, um, is that feeling that we talk about when we're in dorsal vagal that someone mm-hmm. is with us and there's no rush. 
Yeah. I'm not in any rush. And she would say that there's no rush, which would allow me to go one step further. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was one step at a time. And to feel like that this relationship is not transactional, that you don't need anything from me. You're not wanting anything from me. And I think in medicine, it's a very transactional relationship, even with our colleagues, right? We're calling, I need you to do this. Can you give me a consult? It's, and if with the culture of you can't need anything. So when you call someone for help, you kind of have to give them something. Mm -hmm. And it sets up this, again, this culture where it's not okay for you to have needs that if you do, then you're seen as weak. And that's, you can ask almost any resident, what's the worst thing to be called? And they would say weak. Yeah. She's a weak resident. She's a weak resident. I mean, that's I, I think that's the mm -hmm. It's the worst thing for a guy to be called, right? Yes. Weak. Yes. And medicine is so dominated by that. Correct. Yet we're supposed to show up for patients who are coming to us because they have needs. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, in the, you know, there's a lot that I think physicians can learn from trauma therapists about presence. Yes. <clears throat> and, you know, Jendlin used to say when we would focus, he would say nothing has to happen. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let that in. Eh? Mm -hmm. Nothing has to happen. Yeah. And he would say, is it okay to stay here? Mm -hmm. So you can really check and see whether staying in that place where we're really developing that capacity, widening the window of tolerance, right? Right. To be able to stay with ourselves inside ourselves mm -hmm. and to learn over time that that feels good. It can feel good. Mm -hmm. It can be a resource. That's a huge shift, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, Anka. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I was very impressed already on the symposium um, in October. Um, and I think it's so valuable, the work you do, especially in the medicine world. Um, I'm an OT, uh, so it's a little different, but it's still being authentic as an OT is already hard. Um, but the patients appreciate it. It's um, the feedback from the patients is very, very um, appreciative. And I work with the polyvagal theory as well in OT, and it's so much benefiting for the patients. And uh, it's a different communication. And I think this is very, if you have a physician like that, who's polyvagal trained, uh, you will have a lot of safety because you can be open and you don't be scared to say what you feel and how your body is reacting because it's, it's not, um, it's human. Right. And um, this being human, human, I think, is missing in a lot of areas. So, well, thank you for sharing and being that open. Thank you. I'd love to hear if you are willing to give an example of how you use the polyvagal theory in your practice. Um, depends on the diagnosis. So I do psychoeducation. Mm -hmm. And then I do the mapping with the patient, um, like Deb Dana um, introduced. Mm -hmm. And I changed it a little bit in some ways um, to connect to resources faster. Uh, and then uh, we work in the following sessions. We check into it. Where is your nervous system right now? How do you feel? What do you need? Which re resources you have? And um, some people are very intuitively right there. They can tell you right away, I'm here, I'm there. And then uh, we find ways together. Of course, they have to do their work. Um, I just can guide them. <laughs> But yeah, the feedback is um, very interesting and very grateful for especially people with trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and we have an OT, of course. I mean, also pain patients, um, orthopedic patients. Um, yeah, I just inform them sometimes um, like a little bit so they can make their own way because in certain um with certain diagnoses, I'm not able to educate them as good as possible because I only have 30 minutes and it's mostly just hand treatment. So um, it's in a conversation, um, being human, being authentic. So I give them the ventral vagal core regulation space and that already helps a lot. So yeah, I guess it's both, it's doing, it's being, it's um, 
yeah, just living the the way of polyvagal theory. <laughs> yes. Well yeah. said. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and because in my uh, course this term, so you're learning all about the felt sense, mm -hmm. bringing that. Uh, Anka has some amazing visuals of uh, bringing the work into what you do. Hmm. So, so yeah. yeah. I think yeah. of um, Jill Bolte Taylor, if you're familiar with her and her work, she wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight. Mm -hmm. And she had, she's a neuroscientist and she had a massive yes. stroke that spent months in the intensive care unit and years to of rehabilitation. And she says, you're responsible for the energy that you bring. Yeah. And she could feel that when someone would walk into her room, even though she couldn't speak or talk, she had a lot of OTs working with her. Mm. She could feel their energy and what they were bringing and whether they were there because they had a checklist that they needed to do on their agenda, or she could sense if they were there just to meet her. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Maybe I need to translate those images in English. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be great because we can share them then. Yeah, I need to see if I can figure out a way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Robert, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, uh, Heather, you said you kind of progressed one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing or able to describe some of the steps that were important for you in the process. Mm, sure. The first one was being still. That was incredibly hard for me at first, because as a physician, as an anesthesiologist, you are constantly going and doing, which I think equals proving and worth. And so to be still was a scary place. It wasn't a place I was familiar with. And so, and you don't know what you're going to find when you're there. So learning how to do that, how to just sit with myself and whatever came up, because at first so much came up that I didn't know what to do with that. So again, learning titration was huge. Learning that it's okay for once in my life to not tackle it all at once, but to do a tiny bit at a time. So learning the skills of titration, that was really huge for me. And could you say more about those skills of titration? Oh, sure. Some things that worked for me are finding a sensation in my body. So, you know, a common one for me is like a squeezing in my chest, or I can find like this pressure that comes up that kind of stops right here. And finding, right, looking for a sensation, an image, a meaning, right, affect, be really getting curious about that. And for me, it'd be like, okay, well, I am sensing this inky blackness, let's just say. And it's that's the handle, guys, the handle and focusing. It would just blackness. I love it. Yeah. And so finding one molecule of it, I don't need to look at all of it. I just find one molecule and I kind of put it over here and I examine it and I turn it around and I look at it from all sides and I become curious. And then I tend to ask it, what, what do you need? And sometimes it needs words or it just needs a sound. So it just needs, uh, it just needs to come out and I can feel that one molecule come out. Or sometimes it's so big, I can't do that. I need to imagine it across the ocean. That's one that works for me. Okay, it's way over there. Can I look at it from way over there? Okay, yeah, I feel safe now. And But actually, is that safe enough? Maybe I need to put something somewhere in the ocean between it and me. So sometimes I pick Godzilla and I put Godzilla in the <laughs> ocean. And then I can look at it and I can examine it. That's what I find. It's about meeting it, about examining it, becoming curious about it, not pushing it away or pushing it down. And that's when those parts become accepted. And there's, yeah, there's tools like that, that I've learned for titration that have been so helpful. Or I put it, if there's something that's really uncomfortable, I'll imagine writing it down, putting it in an envelope and sending it away. I'm sure Jan, you have a lot of exercises well, what like what this. What you're describing are steps in focusing. So that 
putting at distance is this is step one of clearing space gentlemen's yeah these things all overlap because they're just essentially natural processes in the body yes yeah it's not you can teach it as a tool or a technique but what gentlemen found was that this is what people were doing who were doing well in therapy and in, in their lives mm -hmm. is that this is a natural process in the body so and yeah. what I've found, the part that, that keeps me going and speaking when I doubt is that the more work I do on this, the more I can sit with my patients and I just sit there mm -hmm. and I don't need to do anything. I just can hold that and I feel their stuff and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're so socialized in our culture to feel very uncomfortable with silence, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you don't know somebody. It's like, oh, God, nobody's talking. <laughs> right. How do you fill the silence? And yes. this, this gorgeous place that we can get to where it's just there and we're just going to be with it. And yes. that's, that's just wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the more the beauty, right, is... The more we go down into this place, the more we build those neural pathways, the better it feels, the more we eventually find this gorgeous refuge inside us. Yeah, and I can see that that, you know, that's happened for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And it's also allowed me to accept it. So I name it more with my patients. Mm -hmm. I find that that's incredibly helpful to narrate. And they're appreciative of that. So, for example, narrating how? Um, narrating that, oh, this feels really awkward right now. Does it feel awkward for you too? Because it, you know, I feel like maybe I said something that didn't land correctly. So could we, could we try that over? Or, um, or someone's just having a hard time and they're being difficult and they're angry or, you know, I'm, their response is to lash out at me and I'll just say, wow, I really feel that here. Like, I feel like you are really angry and I sense that. And wow, that must be really big for you because mm -hmm. it feels really big for me. And that's disarming mm -hmm. in a, in a welcoming way. Yeah, exactly. Beautifully put. disarming in a welcoming way this is this is a gorgeous paradox right mm -hmm. this is how bodies talk right bodies love paradox mm -hmm. yeah it's only in our heads that everything has to line up in this logical linear way right but bodies aren't like that at all no and that's so important there's so many patients that i'll be talking to i had a patient elderly patient um wanting to talk about a spinal anesthetic to numb her up. And she just started crying what she thought out of nowhere, what, what's going on? Why? But she had had a C-section when she was in her twenties and they tried to do a spinal. It was incredibly traumatic for her Oh, so and not under, yeah, not understanding why 50 years later, yeah. she's so upset and she's shaking and she's crying. And that's exactly right. Like our bodies, they don't always line up exactly how we think they should. She's like, I thought I was over that years, you know, decades ago, but here it is. Yeah. Memory in the body is not linear. No. And trauma memories or triggers are like, they're happening right now. They're fresh, right? Yes. In a hospital yeah. medical environment, it is a threat environment. Yeah. So what can we do, right? What cues can we bring in? To help someone feel safe enough. Yeah. yeah. Michelle. Uh, hi. I just I just uh, wanted to share my experience, um, just in the sense that you know, I'm viewing your specializing in. in helping patients and healthcare providers, but I really see how it applies just to everything. And someone taking your course can, can be any, almost any occupation or just be a, you know, it can help friends be better friends or mm. just parents be better. Like it's just, 
everything, right? Um, so it 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 kind of strikes me like I just keep thinking of that, and I just yeah to share that. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. I did have someone after one of my talks, um, a resident, stand up and say, "Does does this apply to parenting too?" And <laughs> like, yes, it does. That's wonderful. Yes, it applies to being human. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It must have been quite a revelation for you to understand the nervous system through the Porges lens after Very having different. taught. You know, people get that, right? You know, you, we know that Steve Porges' version of the autonomic nervous system is different, right? It's, yes bringing in the dorsal branch of the vagus that was not part of the traditional ANS. And uh, it, I mean, when he did that, all of us as trauma survivors said, of course, <laughs> we know that place in the nervous system where people shut down to be safe. Mm -hmm. Now it just seems to me like ridiculous to think that it isn't there, you know, that right. that isn't part, of course, it's part of how we stay safe yeah yes and I see that all the time yeah walk into a room and a person you know kind of what I experienced myself a person will just kind of fold themselves in or I've had people put the sheet over them yeah you know just it's too much yeah or this yes or that correct the eye blocking looking elsewhere and mm. I mean, so important for us to recognize because I'm going to interact with that patient differently. Yeah. I'm not going to stare right at them. I'm going to turn a little to the side. I'm going to mm -hmm. maybe that time I'm going to look a little bit more at the computer while we're feeling each other out. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, soften the voice a bit. Yes. Slow, go slow really slow. And then soft and be particularly gentle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see Kat here stroking her. Is that your dog? Your cat, yeah. That's such a powerful way to regulate our nervous systems, right? Any, any of you that know me well enough know I have two cats. <laughs> One of them is here with me now. Yeah. She sensed that I'm uh, tiny bit triggered. She's really uh, oh. sensitive like that, so oh. come over. Um, and I, this is really landing with me uh, because this morning I went to the doctors mm -hmm. and I was told you have something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And those words are just, you know, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm really fine. You know, I'm really grounded. I'm, I'm in my body. I'm feeling good. I'm looking after myself. And it's like almost like that kind of authoritative. No, no, no. There's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, it would be so good if this information could reach other medical professionals so that there's not that kind of power trip of, you know, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah. I'm so sorry you experienced that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because that's yeah. shame, right? Mm -hmm. Shame is what's wrong with you. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it's almost like you're not allowed to say, well, actually, you know, I'm feeling pretty embodied. I'm pretty grounded. I'm, I'm feeling ventral vagal. I'm okay. I'm looking after myself. No, no, no. There's something wrong with mm. me. Huh. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. How do you deal with that? You come to spaces like this, Ken. <laughs> and resource myself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's nothing that's... wrong with you. So important to have our community, right? It's just, it's essential, really. Yeah. And, and it's not I'm, just changing the language, right, Heather? It's changing right. the paradigm. Correct. Yeah. Paradigm shifts take time. Yeah, they sure do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, as a healthcare provider, I'm intrigued as to what drives the person to say that, right? What drives someone to say there's something wrong with you? And yeah, I, I think of shame and I think of projected shame and it, you know, what does, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? Could it be fear? The, uh, fear that you're not going to take me seriously unless I get dramatic with you? Mm. 
Yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, it's we do a little bit in, in addiction. We want to convince people that something is really not okay. Mm. That the things that you're doing that making you feel good in the short run, they're having consequences mm -hmm. and they're mounting up. And uh, uh, so it could be fear that the person I'm talking to is not going to take their own disorder seriously. That mm -hmm. makes me want to scare them, mm -hmm. not even intentionally. Right. I mean, it's like, why, why do we shout? Because we feel like we're not being heard. Correct. So that was just what came to me when you asked the question. Yeah, I think that's, I appreciate you sharing that because I'm, I think mm -hmm. there is a lot of that. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you convince someone? How do you get someone to buy in? Mm -hmm. And that is the model, I think. Mm -hmm. But it comes, I think, essentially through not understanding how bodies work. Because if you really understand the nervous system, then you understand that this person is doing their best to survive. And the downside is self-harm, but the upside is a, an attempt to co-regulate and survive when there isn't a perception of safety. So I think it, it, it really goes back fundamentally to, you know, Western culture and disembodiment and hypervasculinity and white supremacy. And these things are so systemic and it's, it just speaks to the work we have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And to power, John is saying, yes. Yeah. Right. Switching to that model of collaboration and empowering the patient. And that doesn't mean that, you know, doctors may know more medically but how do you work together as a team? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how's everybody doing? How does it feel in our bodies to be together in this beautiful co-regulating way? I always feel like so much better <laughs> after I come together in our community, right? It just feels like kind of like so resourced, so pumped up, so like life is good and we have each other and we're making these spaces, we're building these spaces, one step at a time. We're talking a lot, right, about the need to, to be really patient, to really understand that it takes time. Yeah. We have time for one more. Anybody else want to add something? I'm really uh, curious. Uh, Mary, yes. I, I, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. I um, I'm an ambassador for the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have a mitochondrial disease yet. I'm still on a diagnostic journey, but everything you said today really makes sense. Just from a patient perspective too, really embodying these and understanding, you know, that maybe the doctor has a hard time trying to say they don't have answers or, you know, some of these defense mechanisms that they might have or that maybe a patient is bringing in. And so maybe we're just not <laughs> co-regulated ourselves. And so it, it makes the journey really difficult sometimes because neither one of us have answers. Mm -hmm. And so just even these four A's and looking at it from a patient's perspective is, is really important and can probably help. And then having medical trauma, you even saying, you know, being honest about how you're feeling as a doctor, as patients, if I could better articulate you know, where I'm coming from or what I'm feeling, I think would also help the relationships. So I just want to say thank you so much for your work. And yeah, I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate your vulnerability. And thank you. And, you know, we also want to say that there are lots of physicians who do get this. I remember having an operation and 
feeling really anxious about it because the first time I did, when I, I had my tonsils out, they gave me some weird stuff that made me incredibly stoned. Mm -hmm. And it scared me. I was like 13. I'm like, what mm -hmm. is going on? I must be going crazy. So the next time I had to have an operation, I talked with the physician about it and he was so lovely mm -hmm. and said, listen, we'll have a cup of tea for you, you know, as you're waking up. But it made all the difference. It made all the difference, you know, um, see people shaking their heads. It makes all the difference. And there are, uh, uh, you know, absolutely lots of physicians that are, they're just so good at making those relationships. You see it a lot with family physicians, right? People that go into family practice because they love relationships. Mm -hmm. Pediatricians too. Pediatricians too. Yeah. 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 So we don't want to rat too much on people. No. No. In the, <laughs> in the time. Job. I'm changing. married to a physician. I know how hard a job it is. It's a really hard job. For years, I would sleep beside him and he'd be on call. It was so bizarre to me. Like this pager would go and he'd be awake instantly fully awake <laughs> it's like so weird to see that <laughs> you know because it was so different than how my nervous system operated but he'd been doing it since he was 17 mm -hmm. and the body just learned to wake up right away yeah yes in fight or flight mode yeah Jeez. yes yeah. <sighs> Well, I see people saying thank you. They're so appreciative. Our time is up. Thank you. That was wonderful, Heather. We always thank have such you. great times here. Um, let me just say that next month we're taking a bit of a break because I'm traveling. I'm doing a trauma and addiction conference in London. But we're going to, I think, we're going to um, still do a session where we show, we re record the... Um, recording that I did with uh, Steve Porges. He asked me anything last year. So we're going to show that again uh, in June. Then in um, July, we have Michael Allison, uh, who's coming back, which will be great. August, we have Mark Lewis, The Learning Model of Addiction, The Biology of Desire. Amazing guy. Amazing guy. And September, we have Andrew Tatursky, who's the grandfather of harm reduction. He wrote the book. Um, so that I'm really looking forward to as well. So we've got lots of people coming. So I hope you can join us. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for Thank you. showing up and sharing all of your health sense. And John's going into our, our, uh, our hold, right? This is our hold of you know, one hand on the heart, and one hand up through the face. This is the social engagement system, right? So we say a goodbye to each other. Just feeling into that wonderful ventral vagal place in the body. Yeah, wishing you all well. See you again in July. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rashawn. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye, Heather. Thanks so much. Bye. That's great. Thank you.